excited to have you guys here because this is, well, first of all, this will be the first time I've ever had two guests on our, our little roadmap to learning Angular. But also, this is special to me because you guys are co-organizers with me for the Angular community meetup. And I just am excited for everybody to kind of meet the both of you and get to know you a little bit more. So thank you for being here. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm yeah. really excited too. <laughs> and I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves here in just a minute because I want everybody to know more about where you're from and kind of your backgrounds. But one of the, you know, like just kind of giving everybody a, a heads up on what the episode is going to be about is that you're both, even though you're like expert Angular developers now, you actually got your start as back end programmers. And so, what I really want to do is focus today's episode on not just learning Angular, but learning it coming from that perspective. Did that, do you feel like it changed anything? Do you feel like it made it harder, easier? So, we're going to get into all of that. But um, yeah, like normally I introduce my guests myself, but I think given today where we have two guests, it would be awesome if you could just both introduce yourselves. Like, tell us maybe where you're from a little bit about your work experience, and then we'll go from there. Uh, sure, I can start. Uh, well, my name is Ivani Rivas. I'm originally from Venezuela, but I've been living in Costa Rica for around 21 years now. Um, I'm a principal developer in a company called Worldview Services. I'm mostly uh, front-end right now in, in the company. But yeah, as you said, I started as a full-stack backend with .NET and Angular. And I wanted to specialize, let's say, a little bit more on the on the front end side. Nice, awesome. So, and then, yeah, we're totally going to get into that story a little bit more. So that'll be good. And then, Chris, what about you? Yeah, I'm Chris Perko. I'm a senior Angular engineer at Hero Devs. Uh, I've been there since about April this year, so not a long time. Um, similar to Giovanni, um, I did a lot of back end and full stack work for a long time, and more recently, just wanted to specialize in the front end and you know use the framework that I love the most, which is Angular. Um, currently living in Atlanta, I've always lived in the Southeast United States mostly. I grew up in Florida, lived in North Carolina, um, lived in Texas for several years. Um, so just a little bit all over the place, but currently in Atlanta. Nice. Have you had a favorite place you've lived? Uh, San Antonio, Texas, I think. Was it even really though, like, Yeah, even though like all my family is still in the South, San Antonio just has such amazing food. And it's <laughs> like you can just it's eat your way through the city. So it's <laughs> it's a wonderful place. I love it. That's awesome. You know, I keep meeting people from Texas and it's one of those states I've just never been. I've I've been to quite a few states, but not Texas. So it sounds like it's it's due time to get there. <laughs> Definitely check it out. <laughs> and Giovanni, you lived in Costa Rica for 21 years, you said, right? Yes. What do you love about living there? I mean, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty quiet country. I mean, you can get also you can get to the beach like in, within forty five minutes, that mm. which is awesome. Okay. And I mean, it, it gets sunny pretty much every day of the year. I mean, you got a rainy season, but it doesn't get that bad like in other places. So nice. Yeah, I guess that's what. Okay, I well, you sold me when you said sun and beach. <laughs> I'm yeah. not like, I don't know that I necessarily love getting in the water so much, but I mean, I do a little bit, but not like a lot. Although surfing is fun. Do you surf? No, I don't surf, but I used to bodyboard like when okay. I was young. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. Well, you guys are both down in the South where it's warmer and here in Utah, it's six inches of fresh snow and cold. <laughs> Oh, uh, anyway, I do you love have good skiing though. out there. It's true. Yeah, we do. We have good, good powder. And I can't complain about that. I really do love the mountains. I really do. So now I am curious. I have one more question before we get into this. I love, I love asking these, like, get to know you questions. Uh, I just feel like it's fun because so often we focus so much on like the technical stuff. And I think it's, it's important to learn about people outside of that too. So I'm curious though, because I've always been someone, I've always been a, a real tomboy and just have loved toys and things, you know, like not not necessarily like dressing up and and playing Barbies and stuff like that. But I always had a fascination with like gadgets and toys and things. So I'm curious if you 
if either of you have a gadget or something that you really loved while you were growing up or or even more recently, just something that you loved as a kid and you wish were still around today or even, you know, something that you've more recently discovered that you're just all about, like you, you just want to share it with anybody you can. Sure. I can say, I, I don't, I don't know if they produce it as of right now, but I guess not. They just resell it. I guess my Atari console. Oh, that's, that's the first game video game that I got when I was nice. a kid. And I guess that was a introduced for me to the, programming and computing work so totally did you have a favorite game i cannot remember the name but yeah i was fun there was this game that was kind of the olympics games in one cassette that you were able to play different kind of games within the game so yeah i guess that's that's the one that that i like I remember, and maybe Chris, maybe you remember, the only two games I can really remember on the Atari were my brother and I had this like Ghostbusters one, and then there was a baseball one, and I I loved them both. But that Ghostbuster one was, I could never get, I could never defeat Zool. (laughs) (laughs) Do you remember those at all? Uh, I remember Pong and... um... Like was Balloon Fight was that on Atari or was that was that later maybe was that maybe yeah. that was Nintendo, um yeah I don't really remember. <laughs> okay, okay, well, what about you? What's a, a toy or a gadget that you've missed or that you like right yeah. now? Yeah, so mine's also in the video game category, and it's something that I never owned, but I did play a few times, and it was uh, the Virtual Boy from Nintendo. I don't know if you guys ever played that. It was like a virtual reality system. Oh. Everything was red. Yes. And like I remember playing Mario Tennis on it, and maybe there was a Star Fox game. I remember there was some kind of like flight sim game. Um, but I just remember like after like half an hour, like your head just hurt. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would like hurt your face. I remember that. Yes. I don't. I it yeah. was the same thing. I never owned one, but every time, and boy, this will date me a little bit. But when I'd go into Blockbuster, they <laughs> had one there that you could play with because they wanted you to rent it. And I mm-hmm. remember just want. In fact, I ended up getting one of those. They have a, a VR for Star Wars now, and you can put it on with your iPhone. And same thing, though, like I can only wear it for like 10 or 15 minutes before my my head just aches. And I'm like, no, yeah. why? <laughs> it's awful. But awesome. OK, those are good ones. I love those. Both gaming. So you're both gamers. I guess that's not surprising, though, given that you're <laughs> I have just like loved getting to know both of you you're both so talented recently everybody they've both helped um, with the angular community meetup we have a website and um full disclosure that that was the website that i created when i was learning how how to use angular and so the website was very awful <laughs> to begin with just <laughs> terrible code and it, but they've come in and they've really helped like build it out and enhance it. And it was Giovanni who actually added the Transloco components to it. So that was hugely amazing, you know, getting that on there. And Chris has really built out. Chris just recently finished doing the, like the little bio cards for each of our co-organizers. And anyway, it's, it's been fun to get to know them through their code a little bit. So yeah. Well, for your but, first website, you did accomplish the light and dark mode, which I had actually never done before. So <laughs> it was fun to yeah. learn through through your code on on how that works with Angular Material. To do that well, and I'll admit that was actually Jason who did that part. So oh, okay. He did that during <laughs> one of his streams, yeah. No, my 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 initial site was like bare bones. Just um, we you know we had the routing in there. Like that was a huge accomplishment for me back in the day. You know, getting that in there and those it was just the basic angular stuff nothing nothing tricky or or advanced at all so i i kind of like it though like do you ever go back and look at your old code and you're just like i'm so glad i'm not like that anymore (laughs) (laughs) i'm so good about where you are today so that's a good thing but okay well let's let's dive into this topic i i really love talking about learning angular i as, as you both know, I come from a teaching background and I just love cracking this. I love getting into people's heads and figuring out what worked for them, what didn't, 
what advice they would give. And I think there's a really interesting space here to talk about developers who started outside of front end and what your experience was like initially and then what it was like once you decided to move into front end. So let's let's kind of start, I think, just to really help understand where you're coming from. Why don't each of you go more in depth now that you've introduced yourselves and kind of given a brief overview of who you are, but go more into how did you even get started with programming? Like what was your first experience and um, what did learning look like to you as an early, early programmer? Well, sure, I can start. Um, Oh, thinking about that, that takes me back to school, (laughs) high school, in fact. I can't even remember the grade. It was probably, no, it was school, like fifth or sixth grade or seventh grade. I can't remember the first thing that I did with a computer was using the base three plus. Mm. That was a database management system at the time. So I, I guess that was my first approach to programming, let's say, okay. programming. And I it was just a class in, in, in seventh grade then. That was it from from there. Then I don't know. I like I I got my own computer at home, and back at that time it was with Windows three point one, and I love to delete files to see oh what happened if I delete this file? Okay, Windows doesn't work anymore. Uh-huh. And my father my father got like really mad at that. It's like why you're breaking the computer so much every time. It's like I have to install it every every time now and then. And then when I started college, the first language I saw in college was Pascal. That was in in, in this class called Programming One. And after the first class, I just fell in love with programming. Did you know, like when you enrolled for that class, did you know you were interested or was it more of just like a an elective, like, oh, I guess I can take that just to fill in space? No, it was not elective. It was a mandatory class, but I didn't know what I was going to learn at that class. Okay. And I knew at that time that I liked computers, but I didn't know exactly what I liked about right. computers. But then right. after I came to the first class, this is, well, yeah, this is it. This That's is it. it. Okay. A moment of realization. Nice. And And the other thing I'm curious about too, because one thing I think that the states that America does really poorly. In fact, like I, I will fully call out our country on this is that we do not have a very good, like at all program for computer science in our K through 12 system. I think we're seriously lacking on, there's no requirement for it. And yet we all know full well that most, most students, when they get to Uh, you know, working age, they'll be working in some kind of computer or technical field. And yet we have zero training for it all the way through 12th grade. So I'm always curious to learn about other countries and how they're doing that. So was it required for you to take that, that course when you were in seventh grade? Uh, Yes. Yes. Yes, I was. There was one, there was no choice for me not to not taking it so yes that. That's required. and in college uh i mean yeah I've, I've seen that in the u.s you don't guys exactly pay programming courses as it is right. you have to learn like outside the courses or, or things like that but i i don't know if i was fortunate to get into that have a college or something or i don't know the pencil was really good but yeah, yeah from day one i started i can tell the, the first programming language was Pascal. Then I, in the second quarter, I switched to COBOL, then C, C++, nice. uh, Lisp, Java, okay. SQL, everything I, I learned in college. And it was all very much like with an instructor, like through through a, a course, like through a built out design with curriculum, that kind of a thing. So it sounds like you had a very like structured learning arrangement there so that that's super helpful I think um and then okay so we'll get more into the next steps after that but Chris let's kind of switch to you so what what was your first experience with programming 
Yeah. So I started also when I was in school, I didn't have any like formal training in like middle or high school or anything, but um, around, I think ninth grade, I got a TI 83 plus graphing calculator for doing algebra and graphing and all that. And, um, and then, you know, some kid at school showed me like, Hey, look, there's these games you can download and you can play on your calculator. So that's a lot more fun than sitting in school and, and actually doing your work. Yeah. Um, so then I was like, well, how do you make these? Right. Which going from like no programming experience to game development and assembly on a calculator is like a huge leap. So I started learning basic, which was used for like the regular programs that you can write on the calculator. Okay. And um, I don't condone this for any kids that are in school right now, <laughs> but I, I use this to make programs so that I could cheat on my homework and tests. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I would write programs for like calculating the volume of a sphere or not a sphere or a sphere or like a cylinder or whatever. And it would be like, okay, here, type in the radius, type in the, the height, all this stuff. And it would just give you the answer. And um, so I just had all these different programs to do all my math work for me. I, um, I, I think that might've been your training right there. Like that in yeah. and of itself proved that you knew the math. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I had to learn the math to be able to, I was my own business analyst. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I started was just playing with these little basic, uh, little functions and it was, you know, go-to statements and, and things. So you would like have like different locations to run subroutines and you'd be like, go to this line. It was awful code, terrible. And you had to type it in on the calculator. Um, I think there was a way to type it into like notepad and then use like a USB cable to upload it. Um, but it was kind of finicky. So I just like typed it on the calculator, which was okay. the worst IDE you can possibly imagine. <laughs> I'm picturing like one of those Texas instrument calculators. Is that what it was? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Those were those were pretty fancy schmancy. I remember those, but, um, okay. So then after, after you said that was junior high, uh, that's around ninth grade, ninth grade. All right. Mm -hmm. So then did you go into computer science in college or did you learn programming outside of that? Yeah. So I did buy, and I still have it. I should have brought it for this video. I still have the, um, the programming Java for dummies. Nice. Um, came out like in 2002, 2003, something like that. Okay. So I learned a bit of Java on my own. Um, and then, yeah, in 2005 through 09, I went through Appalachian State University for computer science, okay. which was predominantly back end. It's a lot of Java, um, some C, some C, um, was a Lisp, I think was one of them. Like a lot of these mm -hmm. like old languages that nobody uses. Right. <laughs> much really. So. Well, and I'm curious too, because I always hear different opinions from people who did go through some kind of computer science degree. Some of them say, what a waste of time, because it's all outdated curriculum and they feel like it didn't really set them up. Other people say, absolutely, it was so worth it because it gave me a strong foundation. That seems to be what, like, I personally would probably feel that way myself, but having not gone that route, I'm not, I'm not sure. I hear, like I said, a lot of people say it's really outdated, but what were your experiences? Did you feel like it really was beneficial? I think that there were a couple classes that were extremely beneficial. Um, one was databases. So we learned about designing schemas and all that. Um, and another one was a class just called software engineering, which was, it really taught you how to write good documentation, UML diagrams, and kind of thinking more about the architecture as opposed to just writing code. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of it was pretty outdated, even for the time. Um, when I got into my first job, I had never touched Python before. I had never touched, you know, some of these things that we were doing. Right. And um, so it was, it, it kind of felt like it was a waste of time other than those two classes. Um, but at the same time, like, I think times have changed a lot. Back in the mid 2000s, there was not all these YouTubes and, and Udemy courses for 10 bucks and, or free online eBooks. It was just, you know, you had to go to college because most companies were like, you need a four-year degree. We don't care about experience for your degree. Um, so at the time, I think it was the right choice. Nowadays, there's so much stuff online that you can, you can build experience. You can build your own portfolio with just online material. So, you know, I think, you know, depending what you want to go into, maybe a four-year degree is still, viable. If you want to go into management, if you want to be a CIO one day, having that degree might get you there sooner. Um, but yeah, a lot of it, 
at least at that time was outdated. And I'd be, I'd be interested to see my same school, what the curriculum is today for a four-year computer science degree. That, yeah, true. Good point. Good point. What about you, Giovanni? Yeah, I think going through college, it was, it built a solid base for me as well in terms of the logical thinking, because there were some, a lot of logic, logic courses that you need to take to like to open up your mind and yeah. try to think to see things in a different way that you normally wouldn't see and yeah one of the courses that I remember the most is the data structure one there was one that was one of the hardest one I guess mm -hmm. there was no programming there just learning the basic algorithm and trees and graph and all that that helped that helped me a lot till nowadays yeah. so so, yeah. I would agree with that because that's where I know a lot of my inexperience having come from boot camp land, you know, they, they pump you in and like, oh, I mean, we learned two different frameworks and like, I, I don't even remember. It was so much information every day was something different and there was no consistency really. in like day to day, there wasn't really a continuation of a topic and it was just overwhelming and and so now that I've been able to get more into it and I have more experience I'm very fully aware that some of my weaknesses are with those basic foundational just information knowledge you know things like that and I think where really what you pointed out Giovanni is is so true and that it just builds a, a common vocabulary you know that then that experience of logical thinking that I think you don't get when you go to boot camps and you you don't really get that training as thoroughly when you do online courses. You're you're getting the content, but I don't feel like they're as thorough at training you and really helping you like logic through challenges and problems. So I I don't know. But see you're you're talking to the educator. And so I, I feel like it isn't for everybody. College isn't for everyone. And I don't know, I'm just always curious to hear everybody's opinion about that, but that's interesting. So then, okay, you, you both did college. You had, you feel like great, you know, introduction to things there. Was there anything that you felt like was particularly challenging for you when you were learning, be that in school or even after school? Do you feel like there was just something that maybe it was silly. You feel like, I don't know why that was so challenging or, or not, but was there something that really tripped you up at all? I guess for me was learning assembly code at the time. And also at the time for me was hard learning UML. Why do we need to do these diagrams for <laughs> like, nobody uses it anyway, anyway. Right. And now that is it's, Kind of true, you know? And yeah, I would say assembly and operating systems, like how an operating system works, memory, how it's how it reads, how it writes, and all that good stuff. That, that was the most challenging for me, I was to think. What did you do to push through it? Like what made it what made the light bulbs finally click on for you? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't it was long time ago so I can't really remember what, right, what right. I did to push through it but I, I just it was like that I wanted to learn really learn like the, the good basic stuff in so for me to build like this good foundation to my career so I guess that what made it me just that through. that passion that drive to get through the it passion, yeah and also you were saying it's like uh, computer science is not uh, or going to college is not for everybody. It's like, I and I, I guess I agree. So for this career in particular, I guess you need to be passionate about it. It's like you really need to really, really like it to go through because to, to take this into college, because when I was in college, like in the second or third quarter of, of the first year, like most people started with programming and they, they switched to, oh, to odontologists. It's like, Mm. nothing <laughs> one thing has nothing to do with the others like you you don't even know what you want to do in life so yeah so yeah, yeah. you have to be really passionate about it passionate. did you work with your teachers though like when you when you felt like you got stuck was there a mentor or a teacher that you really turned to or was it pure just determination and push through this 
Yeah, I guess I had got help from some of the teachers and also had a lot of uh, uh, college mates that also really okay. liked it and helped, helped me out definitely throughout okay. the career. That's one thing I'm, I'm kind of finding with all of these interviews is that there really is a social aspect that the people who did drop out and did go to a different college and chose a different major or people who end up going into a different profession it's often because they don't have that social network built up. They don't have coworkers or friends who can help them get through it, you know? So, and I agree. I, I do not think that programming is for the faint of heart. You have to have a certain tenacity, I feel like, to really push through, but it's possible. It is. It's not that you can't learn it. You just have to have that yeah. drive. But so Chris, what about you? Was there something that was really difficult for you? Um, I think performance related tasks, uh, specifically with the database, um, you know, it's like, like, okay, I, I know how to do a join. I know how to get this data out, but why is this query taking 30 seconds? You know, if I'm giving this to another developer to display on the front end, you know, you can't have somebody click a button and wait 30 seconds on a website. Like it needs to be instantaneous. So, um, performance with databases was always an issue that I struggled with, um, I think that was kind of the main thing that, and I think another topic was like ORMs, object relational maps. Um, so when I was introduced to that, that was out after college, I'm like, why don't I just write the query? Why do I need to write this? And I didn't really understand like the reusability of it and, and debugging it and everything. So um, I think those two things really more so with the database is really where I kind of struggled with the most. Okay. Um, and I think kind of going back to what you said about the, having the the want to, and the need to learn these things, like if you're going into college, um, I think that's kind of why I struggled with it because databases were always my topic that I found the least enjoyable. Mm. So I was never spending time outside like, oh, I want to read this book on database architecture and, and performance. You know, it was just like, oh, it's just something I have to do. So <laughs> Right. So, okay. So I think there's a couple things that are standing out to me already here. And you both mentioned um, you, you've struggled with things that you didn't feel like were very like relatable right now. Like, um, so like Giovanni, you said in school, there were, you were going through things that you felt like, you know, what's the point? We don't really use this. And Chris, you kind of mm -hmm. just mentioned something similar to that, where, why are, why am I doing this? Why am I learning it? And I think that's so important that if you are going to make someone learn something, or if if it's important to your company or to your team or whatever, I think giving people that understanding of why they're learning it, because I'm the same way. And I think a lot of people are. It's like, this feels like such a waste of time. Nobody's using this anymore. Why are we learning this? And sometimes there may not be a, a true, like, it, I don't know, like sometimes it's just that your company's not ready to, to upgrade or, or something. And so you're just kind of continuing on with old ways until you have the availability to, to make those changes. But finding a reason I think is really important because then people can understand it and kind of buy into it more. It makes the, the learning easier. I feel like, would you agree with that? Or do you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I'll definitely agree. I mean, yeah, at the moment, probably you don't understand why you need to learn, do this and learn that. But at the end, over the years, it's like, yeah, it was, it was just necessary just to me to move forward to the next level. And yeah. Yeah. And then like similarly to that, though, Chris, you were mentioning, again, that word relatability. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something really important about that. And it's something I've talked about in one of my other episodes where but I want to I want to really bring it up again because I think it's really missing with web development and programming, and and I can give an example of that too because um, if are you guys familiar with who Wes Boss is? Mm -hmm. He makes a lot of courses and you know does does trainings and workshops and things and he has a, a course I remember going back through when I was learning JavaScript. And one thing that he did really well was that even for teaching something as simple as a function, he came up with a kind of a, like a story for it. So it was, it was a function that would literally take someone's name and put the word doctor in front of it. And so he called it function doctorize. Um, so he gave a little story with it. And then another one that was really clever was that it was a function that would 
take the total of like a, a receipt at a restaurant and it would calculate in the sales tax. And that and that's what it did. But he called it, it was something like calculate bill. And he he gave it this little storyline, like he sounded like a cowboy, like yeehaw, I am calculate bill, you know, but <laughs> I just remember thinking, going through that course, like, I will never forget Calculate Bill and what arguments and parameters are ever, because he gave a story and a context to what was being taught. And I don't even know that he realizes the genius behind what he did, but I think that's so important with teaching and learning is to give something that's relatable so that your students can actually connect with it. And I I really feel like, and tell me if I'm wrong, maybe it's just my brain, but I feel like when people give stories, just like when you're in school and you're learning math and you have story problems, there's a reason that you have story problems because it makes learning how to add and multiply easier for students. It gives them something to wrap their minds around besides just these abstract concepts. But I feel like it's missing a lot from a lot of programming. I don't do you have you found that yourselves? Yeah, I mean, I com- completely agree with you. I when I was in uh, at college, um, you know, one of the things, one of the problems with four-year colleges, in my opinion, is that you have to take a lot of classes that are outside of what you're actually learning, right? Yeah. So we had to choose like some science classes, and one of the classes I took was astronomy, and I had this professor for two semesters, and he made it so much fun that I almost changed my major to astronomy um, until I took physics. And then I realized I can't <laughs> do this. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, I think a good teacher that makes it relatable can make any topic entertaining and fun to learn. And when, and when you're enjoying it, you're going to retain it a lot better than just, Oh, here's a slide, copy down some notes and learn it, you know, memorize right. it. It's totally. Yeah. I would love to see, more tutorials, more courses, more blogs with relatable ideas rather than just here's the code, go learn it. You know, I think if we can start making material that does have that relatability factor, it would really improve people's rate of learning and their ability to learn it. I think we would lose fewer people in the industry. But all right. So that's your back end experience. Now, how did you get interested in or what was what was it like when you got into front end? Was this a personal choice or was it more like a, a requirement for your jobs? How did that happen? I guess for me, it happened like naturally. Uh, back at the time, it was not such a, such a division between like front end or back end or hard. at least I can remember hearing it like back in 2003, 2004 in college because everything was like, a whole big blog like uh, with, well, I learned it with .NET and ASPX and everything was, yeah, the web page and calling the database into the controller and all that. And the same with Java, with, with Java we got the JSP, the serverlets that were displayed in the HTML and then calling everything into the backend. So I really, for me, it became like naturally, I, started doing ASP.NET and then I got introduced into the JavaScript world. Then it it came jQuery and yeah, from there I learned uh, Appon JS, remember that, I can't remember. And one day I was looking through blogs and I know that that's like, oh, there there is new, there is this new technology called Angular JS, it's like, Okay, let's 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 see if someone is teaching a course about that, and that's how I started. Then, yeah, I introduced it to the company that that I was working oh, nice. in to, at, at that moment in back in twenty fourteen. Okay, okay, so it's something you just sort of stumbled across one day and got curious about and dove into it. Interesting. Okay, was mm-hmm. there something that drew you in particularly? Like I've heard some people, Jordan Powell was saying for him it was forms. And how he was just totally drawn to how Angular handled form. So was there something for you that that grabbed your attention in particular or just the whole package? I guess for me, when, when I took that course was the idea of writing because one, one piece of code that could work for uh, desktop and for mobile because at the time 
Uh, also, I learned uh, Angular using Ionic okay. in Cordoba. So making like, oh, I don't need to rewrite everything just to make it work on mobile. So that's right. pretty awesome, like mind blowing. Like, yeah. Okay. So the mobile factor, awesome, awesome. And then Chris, what about you? How did you get into mm -hmm. front end? Yeah. So after I graduated in 2009, I um, struggled to find a job. It was a recession. There were places were laying off people. They weren't hiring. Right. Um, and found a job at this small startup company uh, back in my hometown in North Carolina. Um, and it was mostly, it was all backend stuff. It was, you know, doing some data manipulation, some ETL, building tools. And then one day they had a, a project that required like a, a web front end. And they were using a library called ext.js, which was like an MVC way to write a web application. And I absolutely hated it. It was <laughs> awful. Um, you know, it's it gave you all the building blocks, but I don't know. It was just really clunky to build with. So ended up in 2012, uh, got laid off. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> mm. uh, working for a startup during the recession that was actually building a product for the housing market, which was also crashing. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, not a good idea. So <laughs> moved uh, across the country down to Texas, uh, where my wife was from. She was going to go to graduate school there. Um, got a job at Blood Center and also just like Giovanni working in ASP.NET web pages. Um, so didn't really like doing that, but you know, it was web work. This is still the start of like web applications, especially for business. Like everything before that was these thick clients, like, oh, you have to install an update and boot it up on your computer and supposed to just launching a website. Um, and in 2013, we had a new project and this was the, you know, the time of the, the framework wars and so we were like, well, what are we going to use? Like we tried Ember, we tried Backbone, we tried AngularJS, and we ended up landing on AngularJS and we we all really liked it. We we're like, ah, oh, it has a high learning curve, but you know, it's pretty cool. It's backed by Google. And then from then on, I started doing full stack development, always with AngularJS. Like every place, every time I changed jobs, I was like, I want to go to a place that's using AngularJS. Um, this was before React came out. This was really like the, the big framework that really kind of won those early wars. Yeah. How perfect that you're at Hero Devs then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because I remember thinking back when NGConf started, I was like, I want to go to this conference. And of course, they're like, you're a full stack engineer. You don't need to go to a conference just for Angular. We're not going to pay for right. you to go out to Salt Lake City. And yeah, here I am working for Hero Devs. Yep. <laughs> I, love I love how life like works for you like that. That's, yeah. that's awesome. So then what about you? Was there, well, I guess you kind of already said what, what drew you in, but then let me ask, um, was there something that either of you found really challenging? Like, was there something right from the get-go that you were like, dang, like what is up with Angular and blah? Like what made it challenging? Yeah, there were so, so new stuff at the moment. And I guess one of the things was switching from Angular AS to Angular 2. Mm, I guess okay. that was one of the harders moments that we, we went through okay and learning about dependency injection mm. routing all that good stuff I guess yeah for me that was okay okay chris i the same thing i i remember going in i think it was 2015 when angular angular 2 was still like in beta or alpha and i went down to the dev intersection intersect uh conference mm. in orlando yeah. Um, really cool conference because it's at Disney. Like you can just take a ferry to the parks. And oh, I did a workshop go. with uh, John Papa and Dan Wallen okay. on Angular 2. And I remember coming out of that workshop just like, no, I don't like <laughs> this at all. Like uh, the, my main complaint was with moving to TypeScript and these decorators, like you would have to type so much code just to write a component that just puts out hello world. And I was like, mm -hmm. you got to put the component decorator and the selector and this and that. And it's just so much right. work. Um, so at the time I was still working on Angular JS. Um, I didn't switch to Angular until I think it was version six around 2018, I think it was. Okay. Um, and by then the CLI had come out. And when I, I remember when the CLI came out, I started playing with it and I was like, okay, this is so much better. Like I can just type a command and I've got all these files created. It's ready to go. And that that really kind of made it click for me because before that I was just like, I can't see myself typing all this stuff out, creating four files to create a component. And, right. um, you know, so I, I really 
I really was kind of against Angular too at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, understandably though, I think that's all very legit. So I can I can see exactly why you'd feel that way. But okay, so then let's compare. Let's do like a, a compare and contrast here. Learning back end versus learning front end. Do you feel like one was more difficult than the other? Do you feel like it's hard to say because you'd already had that foundation with programming? So it was a different experience altogether. What what are kind of your thoughts there? Um, I don't know. At this point, I guess learning back in first paved the way to okay. jumping into the front end technologies because well, I was, for me, I was working with this and NBC, ASP.net, and that gave me kind of the background of the, the base of switching like to Angular 2, that's uh, to Angular, that, that is MBB, model BB model. Right. And that gave me the base of how things were going to work in Angular and what I needed to do to make it work the way it was intended. Yeah. Okay. And Chris? Um, yeah, I think that they both have different challenges that you have to meet. I think the back end, there's a lot of um, performance that you really have to take into account and, and what kind of hardware this is going to run on and things like that. Where the front end, um, I think in that sense, it's it's a little bit easier, but at the same time, you have to know so much about so many different things. Like what tools are you going to use? Like you need to know about CSS and HTML and keep up with accessibility and and right. then you still need to learn, keep up with like all the JavaScript and TypeScript things. Um, I will say that learning backend first, at least during the time that I was learning it, um, gave me a strong understanding of object-oriented principles, mm-hmm. um, which at the time the front end really didn't have. And now with TypeScript, which was developed by Microsoft, you kind of carry a lot of that .NET object-oriented principles over to the front end now. So I think having that background helped me learn TypeScript faster than if I were had never experienced any kind of object-oriented programming. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think they both just have very different challenges that you have to learn. So it's I, I don't think I could say which one would be harder to learn if you were okay. starting from scratch. Now, one thing that you both did experience though, and this, this I think would be an interesting comparison as well, is that when you learned backend, you were both college students. You had a teacher, you had curriculum, you had expected coursework and probably tests and all of that. But when you learned front end, it was more on the job or on the side, just as as personal interest. So was that experience, did you find it harder to have to go find your own learning material? Did you find that it wasn't a big deal? Like what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, at least for me, it was a little bit harder because I'm not the kind of guy that goes into the, into the internet. I, I wanted to learn this. It's like I need a teacher to teach me something so I can learn the new stuff. But as I couldn't find this to, for, for learning front end technologies, I have to push myself. It's like, okay, there's this site called Udemy or this site called Pluralsight that have these courses that help me out to to build my career on the front end side. Okay, and Chris? Um, yeah, I think it, I, for me, it's always kind of come down to who my mentor is. Okay. Um, there's really been two, two jobs that I've had that I felt like I really learned the most out of everywhere else in my life. Um, one was a job where I was working for a telecommunications company. And I was working with an architect who I think is still like probably the best architect I've ever worked with. And just our code reviews, I mean, we'd have these long code reviews and I learned so much in a short amount of time from doing that with him. Um, and the second time is since I started working at Hero Devs. Um, I've been doing, I've done Angular JS for a long time and I hadn't only done Angular, you know, version six on since for like three years. Um, and since I've started there, I realized like, wow, I was doing so much stuff completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, it just comes down to really these code reviews with people that really know their stuff and really know how to make you a better engineer. Okay. And again, like, I think this is going to be my, my like repeated lesson with every one of these episodes is that it seems like 
learning for programmers is at its best when you have a good mentor and people you can really work with. So that is is tremendously important. What what are some things you've both done to really build up that network for yourselves? You know, finding a mentor or finding uh, coworkers or or anybody who would be willing to work with you. You know, I guess in our careers, uh, in companies, it's like you work with uh, this group of people and sometimes developers don't get along with each other, but you need to be open. I guess that's the first thing, but to be, you need to be open of learning new things, even though, because it happened to me, I was a senior developer in this company and I had, we ha had to meet uh, level coworkers. And they taught me, they taught me so much. And I am so grateful to have worked with them. And yeah, that that really guided me to where to where I am today. Did you have to do a lot of reaching out to them yourself? Or do you feel like people were really open to just offering help? Yeah, they were really open to offering help. And every question that I had, they sat down with me. We went to a board and nice. draw the flow or whatever we were taking a look at the moment and yeah okay now okay so there's another question i'm going to have i'm going to have you hold on for a second chris because you're mentioning something i've been really curious about giovanni where you had a physical office where you were working with people in person and you could just take take some time to go set aside you know go work with each other in a private room or whatever it's becoming less common. I feel like a lot of, a lot of developers, my experience, you guys was, I've only ever been a remote programmer. I've never worked in an office where I had people who like physically could stand with me or I could stand with them. And I've often wondered, would my learning have been accelerated had I been working in person? So do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely for me, it's gonna sound weird, but I miss going to the office mm. and not just to and not and not just to be present, but to talk with the people around, just to make jokes and also yes, to sit at some point like, hey, I have this problem. Can can we meet in a private room? And it gets I don't know how to describe it, but I guess you can take so much advantage of having one one person next to you and just trying to absorb everything that this person is trying to teach you and going back and forth with them so yeah i guess it makes a huge difference definitely okay and then chris we'll go we'll go back you can answer my previous question as well if you want <laughs> Yeah, I, I already forgot what the first question was. I was think, oh. already thinking about the second one. <laughs> okay, okay, we'll move on to that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I've enjoyed working remote. I've been remote for about seven years now. Um, I do think that, like, I do miss, like, the social aspect of, like, hey, it's Friday, let's all go out to lunch or, like, let's do a happy hour after work or something. Um, but I've learned a lot remotely, and I, you know, I did a lot of just code reviews online with somebody else just talking on the phone and, um, and I think that there's so many people remote now that it also kind of opens up the opportunities to learn from people that you would have never met in an office. Um, you know, like coming to our meetup, uh, we get to talk to people that work and live in Australia or New Zealand that I would have never run into these people before. Right. Um, so, you know, I think everybody learns different. I think some people having that hands on being face to face learn better. Um, and unfortunately, there, a lot of those jobs are now remote. Um, but a lot of people also just learn just fine remotely too. You just got to, I guess you just have to find the right people to, to help you. Right. Yeah. And I think that that can be the challenge is I know a lot of developers say I'm introverted. It's hard for me to reach out to other people. It's hard to ask questions. And I think that that's where being remote can be a challenge, but yeah, just, just an interesting thing to kind of think about, but um, okay, so when you both have something new to learn now, like maybe it's a new library or even like with an upgrade, like with version 15, um, we've got standalone components. What does learning look like for you now? You're obviously not in college. You don't have a professor. You've mentioned working with coworkers and things, but but 
more like on a personal level, I'm asking, what does that look like? Do you go find courses? Do you find blog articles? What works for you? And how do you make that that learning really stick in your minds? <clears throat> well, for me right now, like the main source that I have, like things that I want to learn is Twitter. It's like, I see, oh, I'm using this new thing and that's it. Let me show you how it works. And I liked it and then to review it later, but you can imagine the list of likes that I have to go right. and review. <laughs> so yeah, for me, it would be blogs, start reading blogs and going and doing POCs with those blogs and also thinking about what day-to-day task at work can I automate by applying this new thing that I'm learning. So yeah, as I said, blogs, online courses in Kurosai maybe, or YouTube if, you, if it's free. And yeah, that, that would be pretty much for me. Nice. Yeah, for me, I just, um, I use personal projects as a way to learn something new. Um, I currently have a blog that was built with Angular and I, when I originally built it, I built it because I wanted to, I, I had always done some things with WordPress. I wanted to be like, well, I'm an Angular developer. I should have a website on Angular. Um, and around that time was when Scully was released and I was like, oh, it'd be cool to have a static blog. So I built that with Angular and I've used that to learn new features of the new new versions. So when 14 came out, I switched everything to standalone components um, and just kind of use that as a like a playground to play with new things. Um, right now, the uh, directive composition stuff is being released for 15 and I don't know anything about it, but I'll I'll find a way to kind of build that into my site just just as a, an experiment to see how it works and to learn more about it. Um, so yeah, just for me, it's just getting hands-on with it. Um, Twitter, I, I use Twitter a lot to learn from, from people, people post blog posts, I'll read them or just threads about things and like little code snippets that are pretty cool to, to learn from. So, uh, Twitter has been a big place for me to, to learn more about the framework. Okay. You mentioned Scully and I'm, and I'm curious because Scully is kind of the, the, creation of Aaron Frost, who is the owner of Hero Dev. So I'm curious if you use Scully at all with your work there at Hero Devs, or if that's just not something they really have you do. No. Um, right now, the client I'm working with, it's a, a massive .NET application, and they're not static at all. Okay. Um, it's, I understand that it's not being very, it's not very actively maintained. Mm. Um, it's something that I'm hoping to find some time to get in there and at least look at pull requests and maybe help out with that. But yeah. it's time I have the time to get in there and I don't think any of the maintainers like, like Frosty, he's just so busy these days with the way the company's growing that, yeah. um, but at the same time, it's a static site generator and it, it still works with the latest version of Angular from my experience. Um, it does what it's supposed to. So I don't know what more there is to really maintain with it at the same time. Um, maybe there's some new features that people have come up with that just need to be developed, but, um, but yeah, I think it still works just fine. Nice. Okay. And then back to what you both said though, you both mentioned having something like a project to go work on. I like, I like both of your answers because Chris, I do think it's important to have outside projects, something you're working on personally, but then Giovanni, I also like how you're, you're saying you try to find opportunities to use whatever it is you're learning on the job and see if you can implement it there while you're working. I know for me, a lot of times I get so focused on my my tasks and my stories at work that I don't often think about how can I take what I'm learning outside of this and bring it in. I don't know. I think I'm just still at that point with my skill level that I try to stick a lot to what is already there in the existing code base. But I love that. I think that's a good example for me and for others who are more mid-level that it's it's okay to bring in things that you're learning outside of work. And it doesn't, you know, it's it's okay to try to improve what's already there. So I think those are really important concepts you both mentioned. Um kind of kind of wrapping up here then. So I'm curious as you both maybe work with other developers be that on the job maybe there there's juniors or entry level devs you've worked with or outside as as personal mentors wherever is there something that you feel like 
you know, you would give like, as far as advice to people who are just coming into Angular, they're brand new to it. What suggestions and tips can you offer to them? Just start with the basics. Don't try to get everything work working at once because you're going to get frustrated and just, yeah, I don't like this and, and go to somewhere else. Just try to get step by step, like um, from the beginning, how to start using the CLI, the, the, the common comments in the CLI, start running your first Angular application, then uh, working with, start digging a little bit with RxJS because that's, uh, I guess for most of the developers, that's the hardest uh, thing to learn within Angular. I yeah. And, and yeah, and also start thinking into, yeah, into the object-oriented programming that will facilitate you to write code in TypeScript and to have the best practices in your code to, to start from there. You know, it's an interesting thing to think about because your your first comment about starting with the basics. I remember for me when I was learning Angular, there were a lot of times when more difficult concepts were were kind of like introduced to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the right answer to this, you guys. I, I don't know, like, what is the appropriate level of learning the basics versus how much and how quickly do you start introducing RxJS and NGRx? That I think is, is a really difficult question to answer. And, and I'm sure it differs person to person, depending on experience level, like I get that. But I do think it's something that should really be given more consideration than I think is sometimes. People are just like, oh, you know, you need to learn RxJS. Like, let's just it's time to do it. Let's do it. But I'd almost have to argue that I think people need to be a little bit more careful depending on who you're working with. What is their experience level? What do they already know? Because if you start putting overly difficult concepts on someone or, or just more difficult concepts on someone before they're ready for it, that can be too much of a challenge. And I think it can be a bit discouraging for them. So yeah, I mean, I would just say I agree with you completely, Giovanni, that introduce RxJS early. Don't hold off on it. Like, don't, you know, avoid it because I think sometimes people do avoid it. But hopefully your mentors can guide you on how much to take on at an, at an appropriate level because it's just, it can be, it can be discouraging to get into something and then feel so overwhelmed that you're just like, well, pfft forget that, you know, and then you, you leave, but yeah, finding that balance is really hard. So, and then Chris, what about you? What advice or tips would you give? Yeah. So I, very similar. I, I think that Angular can be very difficult for new developers coming in because it is a full fledged framework. And I think that's why a lot of new front end developers go towards something like react where, you know, you learn a few principles and that's, that's all you need. Then you can start adding third-party libraries to do all these more complicated things. Right. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, you're starting out, it's perfectly fine to just write your application as just one or two components. They're going to be big bloated components, but it's going to work. Yeah. And then you can start learning like, okay, how can I start separating this stuff out? Because if you come mm -hmm. into it and you're like, all right, I need to figure out how to do routing and I need to learn modules and lazy loading and and components and in um, in projection and all that stuff, it's going to be so overwhelming that you're just going to be like, I looked at it for a few hours, I'm done. I'm not not doing right. this. I'm going to something else. Right. Um, just build a little prototype and one big component. Who cares? Like, who cares mm -hmm. about the architecture? Right. You're learning. Uh, learn about how Angular, you know, updates the page when you click a button or something. Just learn about the inputs and outputs and just the basics of how a single component can work and function on your application. And Similar then, to, oh, sorry, we'll keep going. Yeah, and then I think just from there, you can snowball out and start learning the more complicated things and say like, oh, I've got this big component. How can I make it better? How can I make parts of this reusable? How can I make it less code by using another component or a directive? And, and I think from there, just learning by a need of like, how can I make this better? will make it easier to learn the other uh, aspects of Angular. Yeah. And that's what I was going to say, similar to what you had already suggested of having your own blog, your own mm -hmm. project that you can work on because you can implement those things as you're ready for them and as you need them. There's no mm -hmm. pressure from 
work. There's no deadlines. It's just, you know what? I, I feel comfortable with components now. I get that. Let's talk about dependency injection. What is that? What are services? What What is all? So I think that's such good advice. And I totally agree with that. You've both had some really, really wise uh, you know, tips and suggestions. And I think it's been fascinating to learn like this, the, you know, the, the difference um, between back end and front end, but also college taught versus having to learn on the job or having to be more self-directed. I think those, those are really interesting comparisons. So yeah, thank you so much for coming on, for sharing your stories and your advice, but I'd love if people could connect with you uh, if they're interested on Twitter. So I have both of your Twitter handles here, but Giovanni, you can reach him at, and you're going to have to tell us the, the backstory to this name, but it's Garf 50. Yeah. So yeah. where did that, where did that name come from? Um, it came from when I was first open, opening my Hotmail account. Hotmail mm -hmm. was on the, was new. It's like, okay, it's I want to cool give my, it was, I want to have a, an email with my name and Giovanni Rivas was already taken. And I took the first letter of my whole name because my whole name is Giovanni Alberto Rivas Flores. So oh, I, nice. Garf. Okay. And there were already 50 Garf in. Oh. in <laughs> so Garf 50. You got 50. That's, nice. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> at G A R F 50. Love it. Okay. And then Chris, yours is. A little more obvious. It's just Chris <laughs> J. Perko, but his name That's is right. Chris, like normal. So C H R I S and then J and Perko is P E R K O. Should we take a guess at what the J stands for? <laughs> Go for it. Is it, is it, tell me this, is it common or not common? It's common. Okay. So I guess the most common would probably be like John. That's it. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. That okay. was my dad's name. Oh, nice. And okay. I wanted, and just like Giovanni, I wanted at Chris Perko, but some realtor out in Tucson had it. Uh, I'm also not Chris Perko, the hockey player. Oh, um, <laughs> that's <laughs> there's funny. A few of us. There's some like Sean Avery, who's a hockey player, I guess. And every time somebody hears my last name, they're like, hey, are you related to Sean Avery? And I'm like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> but. Here we go. There's our hockey, our hockey connections, but that's right. Cool. Okay. So thank you again. And yeah, definitely everybody. I, I have to give a shameless plug here to the Angular community meetup. As I've said, Chris and Giovanni are both co-organizers. They do such a great job. Giovanni helps run the Spanish speaking events that are on the second Tuesdays of every month. And then Chris helps with the English events on the fourth Tuesday and we would love to have you come and join us there. We have a lot of fun and some really great uh, community partners who are always giving out free prizes. And we have really excellent uh, speakers and talks. So come join us there. It's great fun. And you always learn a lot of stuff. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.